All right, how's everybody doing? Can you hear me all right? Good, okay. So, audio okay. So I, uh, as I mentioned, I changed my mind. Uh, and I want to talk about the practical stuff tonight because we're kind of on a roll on um, last night. So let's keep on going with that. And I've actually given talked about this before, but um, for most of you, I don't think I have. So um, um, what I want to talk about tonight is trying to make some sense of what's going on right now and how the how you're going to move forward. Uh, from a practical standpoint, because this is, you know, it's an important, it, it's an important thing to do. And um, I want to share some of my experience, things that I know that have worked for me anyway, that are, you know, could be useful. But then also try and uh, contextualize it, what's going on right now, which will really change a lot of things. So the title I wanted to talk about tonight was Finding Your Way in a Post-COVID World. All right, so um, the the big thing is is to ask yourself. I mean, when you're trying to look at at you know finding your 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 direction, I guess, if lack of a better word, um, I always like to think about is is look at what what are the problems out there? Because ultimately, at the end of the day, uh, if it's work that you're doing, um, you're ultimately solving a problem. Like that's really what you're doing, and it could be. You know, uh, if, even if you're working in a restaurant, you're solving someone's problem, their hunger problem. If you're working um, in construction, you know, you're solving fabrication and construction problems. So there's several problems globally going on right now, some of which we've been looking at in the course and other courses that you've been taking. So you're becoming an expert in problem identification. Um, and that's in our discipline, that's kind of what it's about. It's problem identification. However, when you're going out there to start to like find ways to put your knowledge to work, you uh, it's one thing about the problems. It's another thing to say, look, I can help solve some of these problems or address them. And that's what I'm going to walk you through right now. So one of the big things that we have going on right now, uh, as we know, is the COVID-19 crisis. And um, entering into, if not entering right within the next second wave, we have to see what's going to happen. But uh, one thing's for sure, um, I think it's going to, and others do think as well, that it's going to fundamentally impact the way we work uh, going forward. Uh, I don't know if it's going to come back to, uh, you know, the, the the reality we had before. It's It could, it's hard to say, but I would assume that we need to be prepared for um, whatever comes down the pipe. So one thing it's doing is wreaking havoc on the economies. Uh, it's uprooting our lives. And also it's impacting uh, this whole idea of sustainable development, right? So uh, I had mentioned that on Monday, yesterday, I was on a, um, a panel discussion uh, with a bunch of parliamentarians for the Americas, and it was about the circular economy. And they wanted to, they wanted to get my a take on, um, you know, what does the circular economy mean for a post-COVID world or a COVID world? And, yeah, it caused me to think about it some more, and this is kind of what I wanted to share about you, share with you, is what does it mean, you know, and what does it mean for you? So um, I don't think actually that um, the whole concern about the environment or sustainable development will be diminished as a result of COVID-19. Um, in fact, if I were to argue on either side of that issue, I would say that if anything, it's going to make that, um, you know, the, the demand for this knowledge or the demand to find solutions for these issues even greater um, because it really pushes some of these critical issues right to the forefront. And what the example that I used um, yesterday was that um, what COVID-19 has done is really exposed some of the cracks in our social uh, and economic systems. Uh, it showed how vulnerable some economies are, most economies, uh, and also that that vulnerability is shared. 
uh, amongst different nation states. So it's not like one country is going to suffer and when something like this happens, it will impact everybody and it is impacting everybody. So there's this idea of shared vulnerability or um, interconnectedness amongst the different um, systems, uh, social and eco ecological systems, environmental systems. So, I mean, what does that mean? Um, uh, does it mean that, you know, one group is going to, uh, we're all going down or we're all going up? I think there's some heterogeneity. The example that I used, because it was two groups in the Americas and the Caribbean yesterday, um, in their case, it's rather unique um, because although our service industry has suffered pretty significantly in Canada, their, uh, their tourism industry has suffered, obviously, right, because all travel has been cut out. The problem there is that um, tourism makes up roughly 35 to 50 percent of the GDP of most Caribbean countries. So like the St. Lucia's and the Barbados and so forth. So, I mean, it's a huge impact on their economies uh, and therefore they have to find ways to figure out how to move forward. So that then will present a whole new raft of different opportunities or, you know, uh, different ways of thinking about the problem. But nonetheless, uh, the other point I, I tried to make yesterday, which I would, I'll make again today, is that uh, another thing that I think is a key um, revealing factor from the COVID-19 pandemic is this uh, fragile relationship that humanity has with nature. Uh, because the working hypothesis is that this virus crossed over or came from you know, a, an animal in a wet market in China. And the result of that has been um, essentially a, a global shutdown of our economy. So who would have thought that such a small little ex phenomenon could result in such a huge impact? Um, now, I mean, there's other, obviously there's other theories about where it came from, but nonetheless, it's one relatively small, some people might think benign uh, incident having such a huge impact. So um, this whole idea of, well, what other impacts are there out there that, that you know, fall within that world of human nature interactions and are we ready for them? So um, there's a lot of questions that we need to ask and a lot of things that we need to think about and most certainly, in order to address those questions, you need to have some expertise about that relationship that humanity has with nature. And you're in a very good position because, you know, you're getting professionally trained in that area. So what does this all mean for then sustainable development? And secondly, from a self-serving standpoint, what does it mean for your development, like in your next paths? If you're starting out, uh, like some of you are, where will you go and what will you do? And if you're reinventing or resetting or pivoting or changing or redirecting your career um how do you um how do you pivot like what are the things that you need to do um maybe you're just doing fine and there's no problems i mean you're one of these careers that just doesn't get impacted that much i mean i'm kind of like that it's uh i'm seeing huge impacts um but nonetheless how do you even adapt and change because you need to change uh, and then potentially do better. So all of these questions, um, I think the first thing one needs to think about when trying to like map these solutions out for you is to, to ask uh, about yourself. Like that's the first place to start is the best thing is to do is to figure out what you want um, and what you're good at and, and how you wanna go forward, you know? And, and this is a conversation I have with a lot of students over the years. Um, and in some cases, it's a hard discussion because I, I will tell the, the basically the, the truth of certain situations and not hold back. So I, I, I do, I'm, I'm a big fan of like kind of digging into this stuff because I mean, really, uh, truthfully, you're going to be the happiest when you're doing stuff that you kind of like, uh, or at least you don't hate. And usually you kind of like stuff that you're somewhat good at or decent at. And um, so you got to figure that out. Like uh, for me, I, I'm not a software programmer yet. I did a lot of my earlier part of my career and I realized that's just, I'm okay at it, but I'm by no means a really great programmer. Uh, and I just, you know, I would never want to do that for work right now. So in your, in your case, I mean, I, I think within our, and I'm going to show you some references for our field of work. There are certain things you can look at to try and orient yourself and figure out where you fit the best. 
There are some books out there. One, there's this one classic one called "What Color Is Your Parachute?" Have it, has anybody ever heard of that book before? It's like on the it's on the on the shelf of every career counselor. What color is your parachute? Um, and that's all right. I mean, it's it's. I mean, that allows it. It just helps you ask those questions of going through. You know, what what are the things that really you know, what situations do you like working with teams? Do you like being more communicative? Uh, do you prefer to work in isolation? Do you want to work in more analytical stuff? All that kind of, those kind of things. It's like uh, the Myers-Briggs is another good example of something you can do that can give you more insights as to how you operate. Um, so there's a, a lot of good tactical books out there. There's those ones which will help you like understand what you're all about or what you, what makes you tick. There's some good tactical ones out there, and there's like more and more of them. I mean, the classic one is Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People. And considering that's a book that I think it was published in the 40s or something like that, so it's kind of dated. Uh, and even the references are hilarious when you read it because he refers to you know, the current president and all that kind of stuff. But I mean, that's a good tactical, a good example of a tactical book, something you can go and read and go, oh, okay, I should do that because that's going to help me. But in a, from a practical sense, what you really, and what I will emphasize tonight, there's all those tactical books <clears throat> you, can, you can look at and they'll help you most likely or maybe not. But what is going to help you the most is to really understand your own skill sets and your own and the way of best packaging that and, and understanding the marketplace, like what's going on out there. Uh, so you can fit what you do with what's going on. And I call this your value proposition, right? So your value proposition. And I wish more people who approach me about work understood this idea because they don't often understand it. They said, I just want a job. I like what your company does, blah, 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 blah. Uh, whereas seldom does someone come and say, look, I know you're working on this. And this is the stuff I've been studying. And I'm really good at this. And this is an example of it, the work that I've done and a reference. And this is what this person said about this work. And I would like to really help you with that stuff you're working on because I think I can help you do it and solve those problems because that's what I'm good at. And that's my value proposition to you. I don't think I've ever had any, anybody do that. And I wish they would because it makes it easy for me. I go, okay, good. You've done your homework and you know what I do. And then it's just a matter of figuring out, you know, whether there is a good fit from a practical standpoint. Um, so that's, I mean, we'll get into that. But the one thing is, is the market. Right. So what what is this thing called the market? So um, this is a who. So has anybody worked in oil and gas before, like in an oil and gas company? Yes. No. Yes. OK. So, I mean, that's part of the market. You know, there's potential employment with energy companies. Right. But there's a bunch of different things out there. And this is what I'm hoping we can open your eyes to a bit. Um, yeah, you, you want to figure out what type of organization you want to work for. Now, I'll give you an example of um, people that are really wanting to do good, the good thing. Like, I want to do good. I want to help other people, which is great. You know, that's a nice uh, mission. Um, and then your natural reaction then or approach, for, at least from what I've seen, is this okay? Well, I want to, I want to help the environment. I don't want to help people, so I'm going to go and, and work for Oxfam or Amnesty International or David Suzuki Foundation or whatever. You know, try and find an NGO or charitable organization, which is good. But that's one way. So you, and the thing is, when you go and and take these steps, um, I think, and this is where I'm. I'm kind of honest about people. It's like, what do you want? Like, how do you want to roll? And part of that is is asking yourself, you know, do you want to work nine to five or more, like nine to whatever it is, 10, 12 hours a day for a group um, for you know certain amounts of money, like you exchange your labor labor for money, um, and 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 if you want to do good stuff, like help other people, one way to do that is to seek full time employment with in the not-for-profit sector. But that's not the only way to do it as well. There's other ways you can go and realize that objective um, and you know satisfy other needs that you may have. So, but the, the thing is, I would start with is, what is your vision? Like, you know, for you, what do you see yourself doing? Um, and in totality, like, like, 
I see myself, you know, uh, in a, an executive position, uh, managing teams of this many people, uh, working in Calgary, doing whatever, and and having this kind of a lifestyle. I mean, that's the kind of thing I'm trying to hope you can do because that's going to help you. Um, and once you get that, then that that will be uh, it will gonna it's going to help you eliminate certain paths and draw you to other paths that you may not have been aware of. So. Um, but the, the thing is, like with a vision established, at least an idea of where you want to go, you have to look and see what's happening. So I, as you know, Tyler would probably agree with me, the energy sector is going through a rough patch right now. Things aren't fantastic. So that may cause you to want to look in a different direction. It's hard to say. But this is a, um, a, a website that I think you should look at. Um, for reference material. Okay, so this is Eco Canada here. Has anybody been to this website before? Yes. Wow. Look at you guys go. Okay. So why is this important? I, I think they have a job board uh, to find this program. Good. I think they have a job board. Now I'm not like, I haven't used the job board, so I don't know. I'm not going to comment on that stuff. Um, I'm not the, the, the first guy to recommend job boards. And I'll tell you why. They're good to see what's going on, to see who's looking for what and what the trends are. Like say, for instance, if oil, oil and gas is rocking, you're most likely going to see a lot of environmental management positions at various energy companies listed on that job board. That's going to be a very clear indicator for you. Um, the reason why, so that's, it's good for that to see what the, you know, what the job, what's, what are the some trends? What are things happening in the market? What I don't like about job boards is it's a red ocean, if you know what I mean. So what does that mean? What's a red ocean? As opposed to a blue ocean. What do you think? So a blue ocean is wide open market space. You have the opportunity to go in there and kind of find your own niche and create your own kind of unique offering without a lot of competition. Whereas a red ocean is where you have fixed resource like, I don't know, fish or um, uh, jobs in this case, and you've got all of these people chasing after that one little opportunity. So it's highly competitive, and um, it's tricky to get get you know to get access to it. Um, but I would recommend looking at this report. Okay, so this one here, and this is why. So that guide helped me. Now, why it's good and why I found it helpful is in our sector, in the environmental sector, there's a lot of different things that you can do. Like you can be a field biologist, you can be um, whatever, you can be a policy analyst, you can do a lot of different, there's a lot of different ways to approach, um, approach the problem, right? Um, and what I really think is important is using this resource or other resources to, um, to try and kind of map out where you fit in these skill sets and the types of employment that's, that are out there, okay? So in this framework, as you will see, you have um, kind of more information-oriented occupations, like, like for instance, me, I teach and I do research and you know, write stuff and whatever. So I'm more in that, whereas then there's other ones that are far more practically based and, and, and uh, maybe a little less interdisciplinary and focus more on specific issues. What this does though, what I like about that and why I used it, the same framework 20 years ago when I, when I, le when I left Royal Roads, is you can start to look at what you've done and what you like and say, ah, okay, I fit there. I mean, and it may be a mix. You say, look, I really like being in the field, but I also like being in the office. 
because <clears throat> I know there's some people that just want to be in the field all the time, which is great. And there's other folks that never want to go to the field. And then me, I'm kind of both. I like to be in the field, but then I also like to do office work. I like to think and write and synthesize information, but I also like, I really do like getting out and dealing with stuff in the field. But that reference will help you kind of position yourself and find out where you best fit in this whole kind of scheme of quote unquote environmental employment. And, um, and it's also environmental employment is, has changed significantly. So there's all these different kinds of opportunities now. You can work in marketing easily. You can work in biz dev. You can work in uh, you know engineering or technical type stuff, right? So it's that's going to help focus and ground your self analysis. So have a look at that to start with, and what it will I believe it will what it will do is it will help you help to start you craft help starting you in the the process of crafting your value proposition, okay? What exactly, the same thing that I had told you before, what do you offer to a situation? How can you bring value to a situation, okay? So once you have that, and what I'd recommend for that is just get your resume and get all the courses you've taken and all the stuff that you've done personally, professionally, and academically and lay it out on the table so you can get a good picture of all the different stuff that you do, even your hobbies, you know, and the things that you've learned in volunteer activity. All of that stuff uh, is usable and you've learned about certain things as a result of those experience. <clears throat> and you can then, you know, apply that in different ways. The next thing I would do then is to create a portfolio. And this is what I talked about the other night. Has anybody ever done a portfolio before? Yes, no? Bailey has. Okay. So I found some good, a uh, long time ago, my first degree. Good. So here you go. I'm going to walk, we're going to walk through a couple of sites, and I'm going to include all of this stuff in the notes so you can have it. Um, that I think are good. So the first one, this is the one that I want to really focus on, um, medium.com's um, guide to doing this. <clears throat> okay, so how to create a professional portfolio and content. Um, so they lay it out here, and this is medium.com. I chose medium.com because medium.com is like one of the best sources of um, you know, business slash uh, professional content out there right now. So don't miss the job opportunity of a lifetime because your portfolio doesn't present you well. It's time to make an impression with a polished, polished professional portfolio. So what is it they walk you through? So what is the difference? Okay, well, I'm not going to go through all the details here, but I'm going to highlight certain things. What is the difference between a resume and a portfolio? The difference between re are the following. A resume. A resume offers one or two sheet, sheet snapshot of your work history, education, skills, accomplish, accomplishments. However, it rarely conveys an applicant's true potential or, potential or actual qualifications. Uh, copies of, re, of a resume are often included in a portfolio for easy distribution. This is true amongst the hiring team of a business corporation. Professional portfolio. A professional portfolio allows an applicant to tell a story about the journey it took to become qualified for the desired position, detailing specific skills developed along the way. Part of a portfolio may be a disc or memory stick with a video pre pre presentation or slideshow further showcasing capabilities and creativity. However, be aware that portfolios are not suitable when the applicant is applying for first job or has not worked long enough to garner significant achievements, promotions, or professional growth. Okay? so. For you guys, I mean, you've, you're you know, upper level undergrads. Many of you are, this is your second degree or you're coming in from a different profession. You have stuff to show. What we talked about last night, some people are coming from ecotourism or whatever. That's the perfect opportunity to build out a portfolio. So, uh, and, and what I like about what they've stated here is this, is uh, it allows an applicant to tell a story about the journey it took to become qualified. This is important. It's the story. People remember stories. You want to be remembered. 
you want when you after you've talked to someone about potentially working with them you want them to remember how you came to them and what are the things that you have done in order to gain the knowledge skills or experience that you think can be applied to the problems that that individual or group has does that make sense is that clear yes I want to make sure that you get that. Good. The important part here is story. Now I'll tell you why story is important. Because one of the most effective ways of transmitting knowledge and sharing experiences historically and otherwise is through stories. So what is one of the most noted form of historical accounts in human history a narrative be specific though what kind of narratives starts with m we tell them they are accounts that have from antiquity to to the modern day Starts with M, second letter is Y. M, Y. They're a form of a story. Greek myths, yes. There's many types, but I'm gonna highlight Greek myths because they're a really good example of stories. <clears throat> that have persisted, like they are old and they have stood the test of time. Oral histories, right? If you're looking at indigenous peoples, these are the, the stories, the things that people remember that often carry a meaning, right? And in modern knowledge management research, some of the leading thinkers have noted that stories are the way in which knowledge is transmitted in society, often. One of the most effective and memorable ways of transmitting knowledge is through stories, through narrative. Um, and so therefore, what does that mean for you going out there and trying to find your way? It means that it might be a good idea to figure out what your story is and reflect that story in your portfolio. Why? Because that is going to be the one thing that people are not going to forget after you meet them. Now, if you meet them and you, you email them your resume, I don't know. Now, if you then email them a URL with a link to a website or a digital portfolio that is nicely put together, um, what, do you, what do you think the odds of success are going to be from option one or option two? Someone sends me a resume or someone sends me a nicely written email with a URL that's either a link to a Dropbox downloadable PDF that's nicely laid out with graphics and tells a story, or even better, a website that you've built that lays out all your qualifications in a in a very compelling way with also a downloadable resume which is better option one or option two two for sure why more engaging and more memorable i'm gonna rem i'm gonna remember option two more interactive too, if you make it interactive, even better. More interactive, more engaging, more memorable. Now, I may not, I may see that and go, oh, that's wow. I might go, oh my God, that's awesome. I just got Norm's portfolio. It's interactive, it's, it's crazy good, but I don't need that. You know, that could be the result. But guess what? Who's going to be at the front of my mind going forward? Norm. Norm will be. And every time I hear or meet someone and says, oh, we're doing this and blah, 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 I go, man, you got to check out this, this guy, Norm. He's got this amazing portfolio that's interactive, web-based. I'll probably have the link saved in my bookmarks or at least in my email, and I will shoot it off to someone. I mean, if even good enough, I would like put, put it on social media, say, gosh, check this out. Does anybody need someone like this? Check out the portfolio this guy has. You know what I mean? Like, Make it awesome, make it interactive, 
<laughs> Norm's the man. No, but I mean, the idea is to make it memorable, make it engaging, and tell a story that people will not forget. Now, obviously, you need to think about what that story is, and that's kind of the first part of what we talked about. But nonetheless, that's, that's what sh you should do. Okay, I would recommend that. So this website here, if you look at it, they walk you through how to go about building a professional portfolio. They talk about a table of contents, an introduction, um, highlighted experience. Uh, they include some appendices, like so if you want to include uh, appendices of specific pieces of work that you have done, um, reports and stuff like that. Um, they said digital presentation. I would go digital, obviously use video or other mats as well. Um, and then also include a, tradi a, a traditional res res uh, resume. So you do also want to have a resume, but you want to have um, also, you include that in your portfolio, download your resume, bang, right there. Okay, so take a look at that website. Now, when I first did this um, for myself, I did this second option here, portfolio presentation, um, blah, blah, blah. They say there are several ways to present your portfolio um, three ring binder. I did that. I did a three ring nice binder, like it was a cloth thing with plastic sheets and insert inserted printouts, color printouts of stuff that I had worked on. Okay. You may do a booklet. Um, and, and this is where you kind of, um, be creative about it. But what, what you need to include in it is, um, examples of, of, your work so even if you're using assignments from the course that's or from any course you've done that's fine um, examples of work that you have done uh, testimonials that you have had from previous employment so for instance uh, for for you know the ecotourism um, uh, situation uh, get some re get a reference from the old boss right but that goes a long way uh, I use that in, in business, use testimonials, because people are like, oh my gosh, this is great. You know, this person can do this. This is what this person says. Okay. Um, so take a look at that, this one. And this, because, I mean, you can do a lot of different, different ways of creating your portfolio. But I would recommend doing it digitally. Uh, I would even start with, um, you could do it just as a PDF if you wanted to, and then evolve from there. Um, here is another reference here. Um, on from Indeed, um, they this is a little more traditional, okay? So they uh, they they kind of lay out all the stuff that you any licenses and any degrees that you have and all that kind of stuff. So I'll just push this link through here, okay? So that's okay. Um, so I'm going to look at a few different things like this and to see what. Um, what works for you. And then ultimately when you get all the, the content together, um, like you want to gather all this stuff together, then you may want to do it as just as a PDF, but you may want to do it as a website. Okay. So this is Wix. There's a square is another one. Uh, and I would actually recommend you do this, the last part of it. Uh, I think it'd be a good move um, because I'll get to that later. Um, what's going on right now. And Wix is, you know, you can do it quite easily. It's not complicated to build a website. You can, you can, you know, customize it quite easily and make it look good. So the first step for your portfolio is to determine, well, A, what you're all about, what you want to do, um, and then get all your materials together, craft that story, uh, and then put it in some engaging format. Um, you know, you could be in a, a PDF document or you could do it as an interactive website with a downloadable PDF and a downloadable CV. You definitely want to have a traditional CV in there because some people, they're super old school and, and they'll want to see that. Some pointers though, this is what I recommend. And this is coming at it from the other end of the spectrum, someone who hires people. Number one, don't lie, okay? Show yourself, um, show uh, like you are who you are. And I get this a lot from people who, you know, I've done this and I've done that and I've done this. It's like, no, you, you know, it, qu it quickly comes out that you haven't done that stuff once you get down to it. I've learned that. And you are who you are. And that is why people will want to hire you 
or not, but you know, I mean, if when you're getting hired, they're hiring for you, like and for what you can do, and you want that situation. Everybody has value and everybody has talent. The key here is, is not that's not the case. Everybody has something to offer, but it's finding the right fit. And the right fit is your value matched with someone that really needs it. Okay, that's kind of the real, the core of the problem. So present your authentic self, be creative, use visuals, um, show concrete examples. That's another thing. Make sure you have included in that very concrete examples of how you addressed this and what you did here. Uh, present uh, something that is solutions oriented. You are there to solve problems, especially in our business. You're there to solve problems. Now, what kind of problems? That will vary depending on what you want to do and what you have done, but you are a problem solver. And use your portfolio as a means of communicating how you can address people's or organizations' pain. That's the key to it. They see this in business a lot. It's like find the pain, right? You want to know what their pain is. So maybe if it's a group that's just their sales are not good, right? Or they're having problems dealing with government regulations. And you have just happened to have been working with government regulated, regulators, perhaps in a different field for quite some time. You're going to fly in there and say, look, I can help you with that. I know how these people work. In fact, I know the people. Um, let me help you with this stuff. Okay. Address their pain. All right. So that's kind of your world. You have to get all of that stuff sorted. And I would don't wait until you're done your degree. Like this should be something you work on like tonight and, and on, on an ongoing basis, because it's an organic process. You'll always be updating it and always changing it and adding to it and so forth and so on. Okay. So that's the inner world, your world. And then the, the outer world is what's going on. This is the next thing is, okay, that's you, but then there's, and then you'll go back and forth because you want to adapt what you're doing, what you can do to what is going on out there. So look at the macro view first. Look at specific industries and in different geographic areas. Um, look at the trends uh, and look at tech trends. Like for instance, what's happening right now in energy. I mean, that's an obvious trend. So um, you're going to have to figure out whether or not you want to, you know, go down that path. And if you do, how will you kind of, how will you position yourself? I've got a friend of mine who's in Calgary, who's been, he's an IT guy, and he's been working on um, doing IT systems for many oil and gas companies for a long time. And now he's like, do I even, he doesn't, he's questioning whether I want, whether or not he wants to kind of continue to do that because it's a very competitive job market right now or should he focus on something that has perhaps more opportunities in future <clears throat> that's his analysis though right but for you look at the trends and and you can do that by looking at market information and so forth and and seeing what's going on and talking to people that's the best find out who knows a lot about the energy sector and just say go talk to them say you know there may be a friend there may be a relative they may be a colleague or whoever it is Offer to buy them, you know, buy them a coffee or buy them a beer or buy them lunch and say, look, I just want to pick your brain about stuff. That's how you're going to get the best information. The other thing to look at is to look at the current trends, right? And people often don't do this, right? And it's super important because this is just the reality of things. Look at, for instance, this, unemployment. All right, this is from the OECD. So this is very macro. This is looking at national unemployment rates and how they're, uh, the outlook and how they vary uh, across the world based on the impact of COVID. And if you take a quick look at that, you can see some interesting things. I mean, you can see the spike in unemployment in Canada and the United States and how it has differed in different countries and so forth. Now, this may be too macro for you. For me, it's not too macro because I work all over the place. So I want to see what's going on in a different country. I read The Economist, have a subscription. So it's important for me to get a quick snapshot view of what's going on in this part of Africa, <clears throat> this part of the Caribbean, this part of whatever, Asia, doesn't matter, wherever I'm kind of thinking about. The other thing to think about then is workplace trends. So what what is going on with work itself? Okay, so here's uh, an interesting link that I had found. And again, all of these will be available in the downloadable notes is to see, well, what the heck is going to happen with work? Am I going to go back to working in an office? <clears throat> I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. But this article here has outlined, and this is in their HR group, nine for, of work 
trends post COVID-19. And if you walk through this, you can see there's the obvious ones, increase in remote working. Yes, okay, I get that. Expanded data collection. Um, um, well, this is interesting. So a lot more of like virtual check-in, virtual checkout. I mean, I would thought this was, you know, I mean, there'd be some degree of trust with, uh, with employees working remotely, but apparently not. I mean, apparently data collection is, is you know, a much bigger thing. This one here, contingent worker expansion. This is important for you. It's important because what this will tell you is there is a growing trend of the gig economy. And I call it the gig economy, but I'd say like they call it contingent workers. Um, meaning that it may be most likely going forward that you're going to work on a series of contracts rather than work full time for a corporation A, B, or C. You know, you may end up being um, uh, just putting together a bunch of different contract work going forward. Uh, it looks like that's going to be a major trend. So therefore, having your stuff laid out in a portfolio and constantly being out there and looking at what's going on is going to be very important, I would think, if that trend is in fact true. Okay, contingent worker expansion. Uh, they have some other things here about expanded employer role as a social safety net. Uh, this is in terms of the support that's been provided. <clears throat> Separation of critical skills and roles. So um, they will need uh, more of, about um, specific skills, uh, critical skills that will be lack, uh, that are lacking in in different areas. So it's more going to be, it seems, about those critical skills that are required for any given situation. So this again speaks to the necessity for having a, a very clear presentation of your value proposition because that's what it is, the representation of what your critical skills are. Um, humanize the dehumanization, dehumanization employees. This one we'll have to see how that um, uh, plays out. This is talking about you know how humane or unhumane certain employment situations are. I don't know how that was going to evolve. Emergence of new top tier employers. So you're going to see a lot more hot industries emerge from this. Transition from designing for efficiency to design for resilience. This is important for you, right? Um, number eight, groups and organizations are going to need to become more resilient. My podcast, my plenary yesterday was all about that. Countries wanting to be more resilient because they got smacked down due to COVID. They're going to be way more aware of that. Why? Because they just almost got like pushed to bankruptcy many groups and organizations. So get yourself familiar with this whole idea of how do I do, what, how does what I do contribute to an organization's resilience? And how can I work with them in such a way that they can become, become more resilient? So that in fact may be that you say, look, I just want to work with you on contract on an as needed basis. This is what I can do and we can just dynamically interact, but I understand that you may not want to hire me full time and you know, uh, going forward and have this burn rate going when there may not be work to sustain you know economic flow cash flow that may be you know your value proposition say look i'm flexible i'm here to help i'll go on contract and work when you need me but and, th and that could then be a strategy to enhance their resilience as a business right so i would that's a trend that and then of course knowledge about the actual idea of resilience how do i make you more resilient to climate change or whatever. So that whole area is super important. Increase in organizational complexity. <clears throat> I think this will just remains to be seen as companies reorganize coming out of this. Um, so those are some key trends. There's a couple ones there that I think are per particularly relevant to you. Number eight, um, uh, number five, critical skills. Uh, and can, number three, contingent worker expansion, more contracting. And then number one, increase in remote working. So if you take into consideration those things, you could very much be sitting in Calgary at your home on the internet, having done your portfolio, put it online as you got this killer website or PDF or whatever it is, and you start to then research and hit up groups all over the world. It doesn't matter where they are. It could be Toronto, it could be Edmonton, it could be Vancouver, 
but you figure out who to need, who do you talk to, and that's where you start to pitch them on what you can do for them. And you know, you've got a good story to tell. It's uh, it's just a matter of getting to the right people and trying to find out what their pain is. So this is another good resource here um, from Deloitte. And they tend to have pretty good a summary of you know workforce stuff um, that their their business. Returning to work and the future of work, embracing purpose, potential, possibility during COVID-19, um, hope amid the crisis. So you can read through this. If they go on and on about a lot of this stuff, but uh, remaining human in a technology-driven world, embracing possibility, uh, new possibilities. I think the key thing that I, I picked up out of this uh, was that there are going to be a greater emphasis on values going forward. Okay, uh, purpose driven work um, and part of that I think has to do with just the sheer impact that this pandemic has had on everybody emotionally and that is going to then influence people going forward as to what motivates different organizations you, know, you saw it right out of the bat when you saw all these groups like car companies and so forth responding in a very humane way whether or not it's on the surface or where it's authentic that's just a different issue but saying like look we're here to support you we dropped our interest rate so forth and so on so i don't think that's something that's really going to go away i mean there's just like kind of re, re uh, a new emphasis on purpose driven values driven um, work and organizational culture so guess what you're an environmental professional you're an expert in sustainable development um, you are an expert in the values that are associated with sustainable development right you're you're a trained professional in that so that then gives you this marketing feature that will, I predict, um, be uh, welcomed by a lot of people coming out of this pandemic. They want purpose-driven individuals. So a little bit optimistic, I admit, but at least it's um, something that's out there and that's coming from Deloitte. So they got their hand on, on the pulse of things. Okay, so you got you, you've got then the marketplace. And then um, the last part of this is what is your approach, okay? How do you go and make this stuff happen? So it kind of varies on what you, on on who, who for one, who you're, who's attacking, like who's doing this. So for me, I represent a company, so my approach is a little different than an individual going and looking for a job, um, you know, or or if I'm running an NGO, it's a little different. But for an individual, you have your value proposition, you know where you want to go, you have your portfolio portfolio, that's when you start to go hunting. Okay, I say hunting because it's not much different than that. You map out the types of orgs that you want to work with. I would recommend you literally make a network map, draw it on a piece of paper. Say, look, I work in oil and gas or I want to work in, I don't know, renewable energy. You start to do your research and map out who all these organizations are. And you can do this virtually as well, especially right now, you're going to have to do it virtually. Then what you do is once you have this map created of these different groups and organizations, some of them may not be potential employers. They may be like a university that's doing work in that area and you want to talk to them to learn more about it and find out who the companies are that you might want to work for, right? That's fair. That's fine. <clears throat> so what I'd recommend you, once you have those targets mapped out on that map and you keep that as a live document because you can add to it, you then identify certain individuals that you want to talk to, okay? And you have your portfolio, so you have your, your, your stuff together. I would then reach out to them. You can send them an email or you can just go ahead and call them. But what you want is you want to get them on the phone or get them on a Zoom or get them on a Skype or whatever. And you request and say, look, I know you're busy, uh, but I've read a lot about your organization and the work that you're doing. This is who I am, this is what I'm doing. And I was hoping if you could spare 10 minutes just to have a brief informational interview, because um, I wanna learn more about X, Y, or Z, whatever it is. Um, and they'll say, for instance, I work in renewables, and you happen to find someone who's working on, or like in electric transportation, and you get connected with someone who's at Tesla. And it doesn't matter who it is. It could be someone you know who's a friend of your family who's got a job there. You find out, you get their contact, you reach out to them, say, look, do you have 10 minutes? I just want to have a quick chat for you and get a better idea of what it's like to work at Tesla. 
Um, I've heard a lot about it. I think it's what I want to do. Um, but I, I know you work there, and I think uh, if you if you can just spare 10 minutes, I really appreciate it because I have a few questions for you. And nine times out of 10, people are going to grant, grant you the time. People are going to give you that time because they just people are like that. And if they don't, then forget it. Like you don't want to talk to them anyway. If it's twisting their arm, then they're not going to be that helpful anyway. So um, just be upfront though. And, and go in there and have that conversation with them. Take notes and listen. You know, you can ask a couple questions and then you just shut up and listen, okay? And learn and reflect. And this is gonna get you a much better feel for what's going on and what the reality is of certain situations. And you talk to the person, test, they say, look, I work 14 hours a day. Um, it's a tough working environment, although I, I like what I'm doing, but you know, this is a, this is a, you know, like a real burnout type of place. And then you can decide, well, that's okay. That's what I want. I just want to work right now. You know, I want to get that experience. And you make that decision. But you won't know unless you really get that. Now, if you're an organization, so and, and just do that over and over again. At the end of that discussion, say, look, um, thank you very much for the time. I appreciate it. Um, I mean, if, there, if, you, if there's anybody else you know that, think, that you think would be helpful for me to talk to and you think they would be willing to spend 10 minutes and it's usually you get more than 10 minutes. You usually end up like half an hour on the phone with someone, if not more sometimes. But you say, look, if there's someone else you could recommend, I mean, I'm just trying to get my, find my way here, find out where I, can, where I can put my skills to work. And they might give you like three or four connections. So in your map there, boom, you've got one, and then you've got three more that come off of that. And you did that. That's how I got, as I mentioned on Monday, how I ended up literally doing exactly what I wanted to do after a couple months because I mapped and this person did it, did it, and I got referred to that job by someone, because that, that opportunity. Now, if your organization, it's a little different. Um, um, so I, I know how this works, because I've started something from nothing and built it. Um, a, it's a brand, you're building, a, you as well are a brand, but a company is even different, like it's you're building a brand. Um, now in the environmental, environmental space, um, there's a lot of things happening right now, but a lot of innovations going on. Um, so uh, there's a lot of different kind of things you can take. And I don't know if this applies to any of you, but rather than go through that, I'm just going to give you this, which is a manifesto that I developed at, uh, for a workshop that outlines the stuff that I learned from going global uh, and what are some strategies for, for doing that, okay? All right, so um, what can you expect then um, as we go forward. So what do you do? Well, um, um, stay healthy, obviously, and don't take silly risks with the health. Uh, get that vision executed. Get your vision for what you want to do. Um, start to execute on it by building your portfolio. Start to do it today or tomorrow, you know, and be prepared to work. That's the other thing. It's not going to come easy. So it may take some time for you to like siphle through things, but you are going to be doing things even just following one tenth of what I've walked, talked to tonight during this will give you is is one tenth of of the effort and the, the steps that most people don't do. Most people are just going through Indeed and putting their resumes and throwing their res resume into this black hole. You don't do that because you can, but I you know be a little more proactive about that. And look where there is pain and where there is not out there. So pain, there's a lot of pain in oil and gas. There's a lot of pain right now in uh, service industries like restaurants and smaller venues, the fitness industries, a lot of pain, um, tourism. But where there is pain, there will still be a demand for it, right? There's going to be a demand for fitness. Now, what fitness groups are doing right now is they're doing micro fitness. And you start to see this even in Vancouver. You can see all these smaller studios popping up where it's customized, only one or two people in it at any given time. They're just responding, right? People still want to be healthy. They're just going to do it in a different way. So similarly, there are some other sectors, like in tourism. Tourism will probably help happen in a different way. So you got to think about how that might change. Um, the game, digital and virtual. So um, there's going to be a lot of, of, uh, of new digital stuff out there. All the digitization of the data for risk data, COVID particularly but then also environmental risk and so forth. There's a lot, that's just a whole space, a whole lecture on that. So what do I see? I see organizations working virtually. 
there's going to be way more contracting done, going to be way more creative partnering because people don't want to maintain heavy art overheads. So you're going to be in a position where you should be contracting, be adaptable to working with different groups, um, be flexible with the arrangements that you uh, that you engage with and offer flexibility, be adaptable to their needs. Um, uh, obviously, there's some risks, things with COVID are going to need to, to be addressed. There's all this stuff around that, which is really actually an environmental risk type of problem if you want to look at it the, the core. Um, and then we have climate change and climate change is here, both mitigation and adaptation. There's going to be a lot of need for communication, um, HR trainings, a, there's going to be a lot of education that needs to take place on the part of a lot of industries. So um, I also think that compromise is going to be a big opportunity, right? Like uh, there's a traditional ways of doing things uh, are not going to work in many cases. And therefore, uh, there's going to be some compromise to the new ways of doing things. So be a specialist in compromising. I mean, be a specialist in helping groups compromise, right? Finding that way of, of compromising a different way to doing things, right? Reconciliation is a big opportunity, right? It's something that's unavoidable in Canada. And so I, I think there's all of these things that will pop out of that new tech, and then social entrepreneurship, I think, is also a big thing as well. I mentioned this before, this whole uh, area of purpose-driven uh, work or business. You'll see more of this. Uh, it's, uh, think about non-traditional organizations operating in the, in the plural space. So, you know, in oil and gas, you might have been thinking, I'm just going to go work for an energy company. You may end up working for a think tank, right? A not-for-profit organization that's focusing on energy issues and environment issues. Maybe that's a space to look at as well. So think about kind of non-traditional approaches that are in what they call the plural space, where you have, you know, government, private sector, uh, and then um, uh, this other sector, which is this kind of not-for-profit or, um, you know, there's, there are other organizations that don't fit within that. It's kind of like there's this, which is a company, and then there's this, which is government. There's all these other ones that are operating out there. There's some are charities, some are NGOs, some are just a not-for-profit. And those could be other options as well. So you have to see how you fit with them. But the best way to kind of access those is to start from the start of this lecture is like figure out your stuff, map it out, get your portfolio ready, then start to map out what the market's looking like. So if you're in your Calgary, you start to kind of create that map of what's going on and where you might go. And last and both, last but not least, just go and get it. Um, uh, it's not always obvious where these opportunities are going to come from. Uh, but you have to work to get work. Like that's just the way it goes. And that's just me speaking from experience. And I do this every day. Um, you have to have meetings and talk to people and you know, do proposals in order to kind of get working on the stuff you want to work on. So be creative with it, but you also have to be persistent. Like, uh, and and if, you, if you follow at least some of these steps, I think your odds of success are going to be quite a bit greater than and then if you just took a traditional approach and just kind of start firing resumes off to people. All right, so there we go. That's my spiel for tonight. Does that make sense? All right, and so this applies to people that are new to, like say, if you're just finishing your undergrad, you're at college or you had another degree and you're just getting into it. Or, I mean, if you've been at it for like, you know, 10 so years, I've had to reinvent myself many times, you know, and I'm having to do it now. Like next year I have to do it. Um, so I'm doing new stuff. It's a new thing. I'm working more in governance things like sitting on boards. You know, I had a board meeting tonight. It's all new stuff for me. You know, I'd never done that before. So now I have to kind of like, you know what I mean? Like, I'm not this guy for that stuff. I'm something else. I'm a seasoned executive type of guy, which is a new thing. So I have to figure that out. So this isn't like, a, I mean, I have to do this as well. So figure out where you're at and where you want to go and what you think you want to do. But then, yeah, put that story together because that story is what people are going to hear. And then and if you do it right, boom, you're, lit, you're in the door. And, and you just want to get in the door and then present your stuff. You're at Royal Roads. I mean, you're lucky because this is a this is a good kind of thing to have on your on your a notch in your belt, walking in the door. People take Royal Roads seriously because you know we're a working university. 
Um, we have working scholars, people that, you know, like me, I work for the UN, like I do it. So, and people know that. So if I tell you something, it, it's like for real. I'm not like, I haven't written tons of paper on the UN and never actually have worked with them. So Royal Roads is a good calling card for this, for this kind of stuff, for getting work. All right, so if you have any questions, you can reach out to me. Uh, you know how to get a hold of me. And um, good luck with it. So uh, next week, we will do the one, the more theoretical thing on kind of reconciliation and, and rebirth and all that kind of stuff. I just felt tonight was a night for this, I felt.